This is the Criterion Creeps podcast, and tonight we're talking about Down by Law from 1986, directed by Jim Jarmusch. The tagline for this film, it's not where you start, it's where you start again. What does that mean? And a synopsis here from Letterboxd, <laughs> all 15 words or less. A disc jockey, a pimp, and an Italian tourist escape from jail in New Orleans. It's very reductive. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what that's what it is, I guess. So I, guess, yeah. I own this DVD. Uh, <gasps> I think it is now on the Blue. Criterion. Yes. Yep. Oh, I see. It's one of those early buys for me. I had just started mm-hmm. getting into this Jim Jarmusch when I was a young cinephile, RJ. Watching that, you know. Old dog. Yeah, watching that uh, uh, Strangers in Paradise. <laughs> Strangers in Paradise. Mm-hmm. With John Lurie, um, there was like uh, a good argument, I think, for checking out Jim Jarmusch back when, because uh, as an aspiring filmmaker, uh, he does these small, subtle pictures with low budgets and mm-hmm. just lets things like cinematography, location, and actors do all the work while he sits back and makes sure everything is metered properly. And, you know, he writes low key story without a lot of drama. And if you're like, hey, we can't afford to do that, you just cut around it and you talk about it later. Mm-hmm. He was one mm-hmm. of those guys that was able to pull that off, but also make it look good and make it have the right uh, feel to it. And uh, sure. I guess the most important thing I feel like in Jim Jarmusch movies is to make it feel cool. Um, what do you think cool means, Jared? Like, like smoking t- cigarettes or? Look, looking cool, being having clothes that fit you properly, um, mm. st- staring dreamily off into the space, looking mm-hmm. like full of life, living life. Like a um, uh, a Kerouac character, RJ. Really? Yeah. That's what you're gonna drop on me right now, huh? That's right. Wow. On the, ro- on the road, my friend. <laughs> I don't like you. <laughs> um, much. So yeah, yeah. Jim Jarmusch was one of those guys that came on my radar. I don't know how, exactly what movie I would have seen first. It might have been um, uh, Dead Man. With, Patterson with uh, Johnny Depp. Oh yeah, that, that, not Samurai Dog. That, no, yeah, Ghost Ghost Dog came later. Ghost Dog. No, yeah. no. Yeah. With that great score, that great soundtrack that people always talk about. That was Who does the soundtrack in uh, Ghost Dog? Look it up. He, isn't it a bunch of people? I don't or know. Maybe just one artist. I don't know. I don't recall. I'll check it out. That's more your territory. Okay. So I'll check it out. yeah, so this was the second time of me watching this movie. Um, what to say about it? I like prison movies, but uh, this movie is kind of a prison movie, but it, it, it doesn't care about the prison movie dynamics because mm. y- you don't really leave the cell once you get in there. Um, mm-hmm. And then they spend this uh, uh, the right amount of time, I guess, in a cell, and then they break out effortlessly <laughs> between cuts, running through tunnels and then appearing outside of it, and then they're just running through the woods and then mm-hmm. making their way down a path and... Uh, yeah, I don't know. This is a movie of slightness, of small moments, of characters that are kind of just shuffling along through and saying, whatever. We got mm-hmm. we got Jack. We got Zach. Which one's which, and? RJ? It doesn't matter. That's the point. Yeah. John Lurie, Tom Names Williams. Names don't matter. And then we got Bob. 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 Played so by was... one Roberto Benigni. Benigni. Everyone's Roberto favorite. Roberto Benigni. Uh, speaking of names, uh, the soundtrack was done by RZA. See, I wasn't—I wasn't sure it was going to be the Wu Tang Clan. I wasn't sure it was going to be RZA or the Giza. Yeah. See, I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, Giza or Giza, however you want to pronounce it, he's more known for his solo work, like Liquid Swords. Mm-hmm. But RZA, he's a little bit more tapped into the movie scene. He—I mean—he acts quite a bit. You might remember him from uh, that hit show, Californication. But it was RZA and then other people as well. So uh, Wu-Tang Clan, uh, there was no old dirty bastard, Raekwon the Chef, Respect the Deck, Ghostface Killer. Those guys weren't here, but uh, RZA's around. So what were we talking about? Uh, Jim Jarmusch. Oh, Jarmusch. Oh, and Roberto Benigni. Uh, last week, RJ, when uh, yes. on, on our outro, I said that we were doing huh. this, and I think you were like, oh, Jim Jarmusch, but... And I was well, curious what you, why, because I know you like that Patterson. 
Yeah, no, I thought Patterson was good. So Jim Jarmusch, well, I think what I said was I'm not sure if I'll like it. So I did like Patterson. Patterson's pretty good. And, and like Broken Flowers isn't bad. With that Bill Murray. With, with Star, Star Bill of Murray. Meatballs. <laughs> Star of Meatballs himself. Uh, yeah, and like I've seen coffee and cigarettes. Rizzo's in that, actually. There you go. And I think someone else from Wu-Tang is in that, too. Um, yeah, Giza. Rizza and the Giza are in uh, Coffee and Cigarettes. So I like that. My aversion to Jim Jarmusch, I guess, would have been later day Jarmusch. Sure. Um, I haven't seen Only Lovers, but I think you weren't super hot on it, right? I was not. And uh, I've mentioned before, um, old roommate Scott, uh, when me and him were hot and heavy hitting these Criterions pre-podcast days, I know he got a mystery train in... I think it was Mystery Train, and he was kind of like, you know what? I didn't really, I didn't really like it. He's like, I didn't get much out of that. I was like, oh, all right. So I think kind of painted this picture for me. But mm. Only Lovers, Mystery Train, and then uh, I was kind of like, I don't really know what to think about Jim Jarmusch other than um, the cheese shark, not the cheese fish, but the cheese shark from the best Criterion movie we've watched so far, Fishing with John. Mm. That, and then on top of a. Uh, his new movie, the zombie movie, which is like, Ugh. I don't who who wants that? But yeah. still, you know, Riz is in it, <laughs> of course, and Tom Waits is too, and Iggy Pop, and Iggy Pop, yeah. Well, we'll watch it, I'm sure, but still, you know, yeah. So that 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 was more or less what I was thinking. Is kind of like so, I don't know about yeah. Jim Jarmusch. I, I like the stuff I've seen, so but I, I had this moment, like, yeah, so. Watching Down by Law, I was and thinking about like Jim Jarmusch and his like kind of place in cinema now, because there was a point in time where he yeah. kind of was like one of the like the the it kids of like the independent film scene. Sure, but then Wes Anderson came along, <gasps> and I, I feel like Wes Anderson is the like uh, kind of that disaffected kind of hipness thing better. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like yeah. Jim Jarmusch is kind of left to the sidelines. Like he never, I think he's still making the movies that he wants to make. Like he's, he's kind of like, I mean, if you, I'm looking over his filmography right now. And it's like, no, this guy uh, has a definite like style and flair to his movies. Cause really he's got 16, no, 12 feature films specifically. Uh, and he's got a bunch of like short odds and ends. He's got things like give me danger on the stooges. Like these kind of like concert Ooh, videos. Jarmusch? Yeah. Jarmusch. Yeah, and like 17 coffee and cigarettes shorts, right? Yeah, there's all those iterations of that. And that's always never been yeah. like my – like I was never really super into coffee and cigarettes or anything like that. But You're you're more of a comedians and cars getting coffee guy, right? <laughs> Instead of – do you know what I mean, Jared? Can't say as I am. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about there? That's a funny joke yeah. about uh, – preamble stuff we talk about sometimes yeah yeah you know you know what i'm talking about but yeah stranger than paradise i i like quite a bit um is, is that the, in the collection it is and we will cover it one day down the road but okay. um yeah that movie because it's very like in line with like kind of the uh french new wave stuff but okay. an uh, an american in 1984 kind of doing his version of it and like it's a jim jarmusch movie like all the like the long takes this uh, kind of like static camera that just like lets scenes play out. John Lurie, um, the use like re- repetitive use of music. Mm-hmm. Um, it's all there. It's like kind of all these these styles of his. Like he's trying to go for I think perhaps like a lack of style, but like be, be, through that his style comes through. And this is no different. Um, yeah, like this movie is opens up with the introduction of yeah we have I think it's John Lurie first who plays the pimp mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. his. Some of his his hoes, and Ooh, shit, um, Jarrett. it's just these like you get the sense you don't even get the sense that he's like uh, like a pimp. He seems kind of like indifferent to like the the, the school of pimpology. He seems like he's just kind of like de- removed he's, from he the situation. La- yeah, he's just like kind of what you usually what I actually I would expect from a lot of pimps. They're kind of lazy at the end of the day. They like they live off yeah. the veils of another human being exploiting them. You know because they're like the worst types of people out there, honestly. But, well, other uh, than you. But, he, but he seems pretty cool, you know. He's like a nice. He's a he's a good looking guy. He's a good looking <laughs> well, guy. I mean, he's he's good not, looking guy he's this not John Lurie. The women, I guess. yeah, exactly. So that... But like, he's like not like not, you know, like he hands a gun to his uh, his lady, and she like puts a gun on him. And he's like, oh, whatever. I mean, she's gonna shoot me. I'm not really afraid of it. I don't think she's going to because he's got kind of a confidence to him. 
My confidence, you yeah. say. And then, you know, he gets uh, he gets set up by this uh, Southern Dandy kind of fella. They're, they're always they're Southern Dandy, RJ. Okay. And uh, he's, like, trying to make good with them, but you're like, uh, I don't think this is going to end well. And so he mm-hmm. goes to a – because he's an opportunist uh, being a pimp, and he shows up to, like, uh, corral a new girl into his uh, under his care. But it turns out she's a minor. And the cops come and uh, take him away. And that scene, man, that scene is, like, so well played. And, like, John Lurie's, like, horror of, like, what's just happened is, like, so uh, so good. <laughs> well realized. Like, I'm, just, like, I'm just here with my girlfriend. Oh, man, it's so brutal. And then it, the reveal of, like, oh, there she is under the blankets. And you're like, and he's, oh, God damn it. <laughs> like, yeah, very well played. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll be honest with you, Jared. I didn't see that one coming, oh. and neither did Andrea because she watched this with me, and it happened. And we were both like, "Whoa, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah." That's it. Yeah, it's, it's pretty. We were surprised. F- yeah, no, it's. Uh, I, I I knew it was coming because I don't know if I remembered it from the movie, but like as the movie started getting going, I was like, "Oh yeah," and then I, but I didn't re- real like I didn't remember how young the girl was either. And then when you're you like see 10 her, years old, oh, yeah, and you're like, "Oh, dude," it's like you're going away. <laughs> So like this is a you got you got because it's not like the Louisiana police, the New Orleans police are going to be like really like we should look into the, his claims that he's innocent. Like they don't give a shit. He's, what a, he's a pimp. He's a bad what guy. Did you, what did you feel about that cop's uh, presence after uh, they've escorted John Lurie out of there? He's like, there's, it's okay, baby. Uh, yeah, there's. I'll weird, make sure you're okay. There's there's some weirdness there because it kind of fades away. It's it's well, a, yeah, it's I, a little ambiguous. I found it weird though. I mean, him sitting on the bed, I thought was weird. You're like. Hmm. Hmm. What, RJ? Do you not trust the police? I don't trust you. Okay. You sent him a cop. I don't know. We've never, we've never <laughs> you, found. You've out. never asked. I've never asked. <laughs> I don't know what you do recording, outside of I've this. I've been recording all these conversations for years now, and uh, here we, we met on we met on the internet. I don't know what you do in your real life. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yep. Um, and then also you have that story, and then we have uh, Tom Waits. He's mm-hmm. a like kind of down and out disc jockey. Um, mm-hmm. He just like had a bad breakup with a girlfriend. He's getting wasted, kind of a layabout. He's hanging out like, as one does in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. And um, he, he comes across Bob for the first time, uh, old Roberto Benini, who uh, does not speak any English. He's playing Roberto the, Benini. He's playing the foreigner in America, you know, mm-hmm. doing the, doing the thing. And then, uh, he gets an opportunity presented to him by another scumbag, another man in a fedora and uh, mm-hmm. sweaty, saying, yeah, you should have, all you have to do is make some easy money. Do me a favor and just drive this car. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, okay, because I'm Tom Waits. And uh, sure enough, he's- Wait, he, well, he, what was that? How did Tom Waits talk? <laughs> he has, because he, has, he, has said, he calls himself Tom Waits, and he will do that because he's Tom Waits. As he grabs yeah, it out. So and uh, he, 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 he's very drunk. And uh, he gets pulled over, you know, routine uh, stop. And, oh, there's a dead body in the trunk. And uh, so he's going to jail. They're all going to jail. Um, mm-hmm. Tom Tom and John, Zach and Jack, they don't get along at first. And then they kind of work it out, as men do. And then, uh, then Roberto Bob shows up. And uh, it turns out he definitely killed somebody. Like, he, he actually deserves to be in there. I, I, Ooh, Roberto theory. Benigni? Yeah. yeah. Well, but, I mean, if you take his story at uh, face I, value. I, I feel like there's no re- he has no reason to lie. He tells the story as it is. I think that's like kind of the thing where it's like the other two yeah. like kind of got screwed over and mm-hmm. he definitely killed somebody, but you could argue it's self-defense. But uh, You could. You could. Uh, I mean, you know, he just, I mean, he was, his, his crime was he was cheating uh, at cards and then he got caught on it and then when a man came to potentially end his life, he defended himself. And what a, would you a, have done? A, a good defense attorney would, could get him out easily. Mm. What would you have done? Uh, I don't gamble. But what would you have done, Jarrett? <laughs> I don't know. No no man knows until he's put into that situation himself. Okay, that's fine. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and then, yeah, so they hang out in the jail cell for a bit. Mm-hmm. There's, there's mm-hmm. some, like almost a musical number. We get a, we get we get the Roberto Benigni experience. This is uh, before he became known to America. 
Um, and people like turned hard on Roberto Benini and just started. Why did they turn? Oh, because of Pinocchio. Uh, it was before Pinocchio. I think it was like because he was started like showing up in lots of different things. Like so, after Life Is Beautiful, he became sort of like on the. He was like at the Oscars and he was all wacky and people were like, "This guy's f- a little bit much." Like this He's is just a, guy a lovable of, goofball, of though, R- Jared. R- RJ, if you were a little bit older, I feel like you would have been like, "I fucking hate this guy." Oh, maybe I hate a lot of people. You do. You you, you very quick to hate. I I hate you. Yeah, there you I go. know that much, but uh, I don't know. So far, my experience with Roberto Benigni is fine. There, we had a huge oversight. Have you heard of this movie called Il Piccolo di- Diavolo, <laughs> directed by Roberto Benigni, uh-huh. starring Roberto Benigni, also starring John Lurie, also starring Walter Matthau? What? No Tom Waits. Well, no, <laughs> but. But those guys, okay. Well, anyway, is, is it any what, good? Whatever. Is, 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 is it supposed to be good? I don't know. There's only been like uh, on Letterbox. There's only been like fucking 500 people have logged this. That's it. That's more people than have watched probably Black Metal Veins. But... Yeah, but nobody gives a shit about that piece of shit show that you watched earlier. <laughs> nobody. 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 So nobody. They break out of jail, RJ, and down by sure. law. Very effortlessly, they escape. And, I kind of, uh, yeah. And, and then that's, and then they, uh, no one seems to be looking. I, it's interesting that this movie was made of, uh, with the cooperation of uh, the state of Louisiana because this really exposes uh, Louisiana as like real, real chumps. They, they, was it in the cooperation of the state? It was, yeah, at the end of the movie. Do you think they were uh, forward with what they were with? what Jim Jarmusch was trying to do, or was he like, we're just making a nice little movie. Yeah, it's about movies. It's a movie it's about, about movies. movies, and who cares? Who cares what happens? What is Jim Jarmusch? Is he from, like, New York, or, like... Uh, I think so. He's sure. he, he He's a very New York-looking dude. He's got that Abel Ferreira look. He's got that, he, ama- he's got that amazing hair, second yes, only to David Lynch. However, yeah, exactly. We've mentioned that he has nice hair, but it is no David Lynch. No. It is no David Lynch. So couple things. Um, mm-hmm. I think this movie is pretty cool. I enjoy it. Um, I don't think it's like a movie you just pop on and want to watch at any given moment. But, you know, it'll be around maybe when I want to watch it again in like 10, 15 years when I save myself up to watch uh, all of Jim Jarmusch's movies again. When are you uh, going to do that? 10, 15 years from now. Question Why? mark. Exactly. So um, one thing, though, man, this movie looks amazing. The cinematography, the black and white of this, like, looks so good. Uh, people always, like, nowadays, these modern movies, they try to do a black and white look, and it never looks as good as this does. So I don't know yeah. what what the trick is, uh, why it's so hard for people to do it now, considering all the, like, Roma, for instance. I don't think Roma oh. looks that great compared to this. But, Jared, it's black and white. Yeah, I know. In the... <laughs> We talked a lot about it. Okay, so the guy who shot this, uh, Rob Robbie Mueller, also shot such films as Paris, Texas, Repo Man, uh, mm-hmm. worked with Jim Jarmusch a whole bunch. Oh, oh my goodness, To Live and Die in L.A., Breaking the Waves, Lars von Trier, Dancer in the Dark, Lars von Trier. My goodness, RJ. I Barfly. Don't, I don't. Shot, he shot. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll yeah, give yeah. you that one. There you go. That one. So anyway, yeah, some people, they're really good at their jobs. This is a good demonstration of it. But yeah, Jim Jarmusch, he takes the black and white quite well, better than most. Mm-hmm. Um, this whole movie rips open with some Tom Waits songs. Song does about, it? It does. But Is it the Clawhammer song? No. Ah, I'm no, not It's a uh, jockey full of bourbon, RJ. And What's that song about? Um, Singing. <laughs> it's about... Lots of panning shots of uh, uh, Louisiana, which are great. Uh, set the mood right away. Feels like a music video. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah. And then so yeah, anyway, the movie wraps up with uh, they escape and then they stumble across a uh, Luigi's, uh, <gasps> Luigi's Shack. Uh, which place? It's like a tin, tin place. They, they make tin. The tin top. Tin top. Yeah. They make tin in lasagna in the restaurant. And uh, cool. it yeah. turns out she's an Italian broad, this lady working there mm-hmm. and uh that that's great 
for Roberto Benigni and her. They hook up, and uh, her uncle has a bunch of a bunch of like very nice '50s golf clothes that uh, Tom and John can wear. They look very nice and fit. Everyone's nice and fit in this movie. No, uh, how so? No, no largeness <laughs> on display. We are like, you know, most people are like have some weight on them. Not these guys. Mm. Lean and mean these two, and uh, yeah, they uh, they hit the road and then they uh, go their separate ways. After a, a, a fake out handshake, and they have a laugh, <laughs> wish each other luck, and they call it a day. That's done mm-hmm. by law. Wait, what movie were you just describing? <laughs> RJ, what did you think of Down by Law? Do you actually care? Well, I'm. I, if I'm, I doubt if it. I'm, if I'm cool like a Jim Jarmusch character, I don't care. Are you smoking cigarettes over there? I should be. Um. So as you mentioned earlier, I was like, I don't know if I'll like this. Uh, not because I've ever had really a bad experience with Jim Jarmusch, but it's like you said, I don't know. His recent endeavors, it's like, I don't care that much. Is that any mark on his previous quality? Not really. So I watched Down by Law. On that Criterion channel, uh, there's a plug for you. Where's our endorsement? Where indeed. Where indeed. So I watched this with Andy. Uh, When the movie finished, uh, quote, Andy said, that movie sucked. (laughs) End quote. And I said, Okay, uh, I wasn't as hard on it as she was. I thought this movie was fine, to be honest. Like, um, there wasn't anything that I disliked about it, uh, and there was a lot of stuff I did like. I don't think it's a great movie by mm-hmm. any means, but uh, there, I think there are a lot of qualities for me, at least, that I was like, oh, I like that. That's fun. Um, I do like his pacing for certain things. Oh, Jesus. Uh, I like his pacing for certain things like um, the way the best example is like the way the prison break happens where it goes from him. He's like, hey, guys, I think I maybe have a way out of here. And they're like, tell us more. And then the next scene is them already out of the jail. I, I actually I thought that was super funny. I was well, like, I like, like that compared to um, uh, Le Tro- every other Le, Le Tro- Le Tro- which is like the whole thing. Well, but but it builds some. It, but I mean, that movie is that movie is amazing. Well, so <laughs> any other prison movie, like you, what you said, it, it's kind of like subverts it a little bit where yes. it's like most prison break movies are about the art or, or the act of breaking out where this one is just like, ah, whatever. It's like, we're, we're not even going to worry about that. Let's just say that they got out somehow. It's fine. Yeah. So I actually enjoyed that quite a bit. I mean, you can I make really, an, RJ, you could make an entire TV show about breaking out of prison. What would uh, what would you do after they got out though? Would you like reincarcerate them in like a Mexican prison or something weird? Somewhere in Cuba. Was it in Cuba? It, it was some like island destination. I thought it was Mexico, but I'm racist. I think. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't. Me- it wasn't Mexico. But I uh, I am playing a character for the podcast. So, anyways, I did like uh, the way that they did that. Uh, I like all the characters quite a bit. Zach, Jack. And Bob, um, I think John Laurie is really good. He's is he the best actor? Not really, but like he serves his roles well enough. Where uh, what is this? The third time he's popped up in the Criterion between Fishing with John and Last Temptation. Oh yeah, yeah. Like he doesn't. Right. I don't know if he has any like actual spoken lines in Last Temptation, but he's, he's in there. I think he does, but yeah, he's like, yeah. everyone's everyone's bearded in that, so it's sometimes hard to tell. It's hard to tell. Yeah. So yeah, he uh, yeah he's not the best actor, but I I like John Murray well, quite we'll, a bit. we'll see him at least one more time with uh, Paris, Texas. <laughs> it's, well, and Stranger Than Paradise, right? Yep. Yeah, so he, he'll come back a whole bunch of times. A whole he's bunch. an alumni. Two a whole years. bunch of times. Two even. <laughs> A whole bunch of times. Um, well, until Desperately Seeking Susan hits. Is that a good show? Madonna? Well, what about that Roberto Benigni movie I was talking about? <laughs> that is not. <laughs> what are you? Are you not on board with that? Continue. Whatever. I don't give it. I don't care, dear. Continue. So, yeah, John, John Lurie is fine. Uh, I like him quite a bit. As I've mentioned many times, Fishing with John is probably my favorite movie. <laughs> Uh, Tom Waits is good. I like Tom Waits in this uh, quite a bit. His 
as you went after I logged this on Letterbox, you were sending me gifts of uh, pointed shoes, like metal tipped shoes. Uh, that is a nice little touch in this. I don't know. I, I like Tom Waits in this. Like his character, the DJ thing is it's not important no. and it's not it's not supposed to be either. Yeah, there, it seems to like be there to like pass the time occasionally when there otherwise he yeah. have nothing to talk about. But then he I can, think then he can launch into DJ voice talking about the weather. Yeah. I think it's almost even other outside of that. I think it's just to make Tom Waits like a believable person to exist in the world yeah. because when you look at him you're like who is this guy? Where do, where is he? Like he either works in a KFC or he's a musician. There's no in between. Where, where's his brother, Ron Perlman? Ron Perlman? Well, he was doing some stuff, Jared. Stuff mm. you don't want to know about. Yeah. But I I like when I actually I really like when he wears his hairnet in the prison cell all the time. I don't know why. It's fun. Mm -hmm. He he looks like he's a fun guy. Like he's kind of like scary, not in like an intimidating sense, but in the sense where it's like. I don't know what he's going to do, this guy. He's unpredictable, Jared. A wild card. Wild card. So uh, I like both of those boys. Uh, Bob is, I think, incredible. I, li I like Bob quite a bit. Uh, I think he's very funny. I don't find him annoying. He's not like, I think it's like you said. If he was an actor today, Roberto Benigni, he would be like almost Bill Paxton in Aliens level annoying, For I you. think. yeah. For me, yeah, for sure. But in this, I don't find him annoying. I find him quite charming. And uh, I think he's like the play in between all three of them is really good because it's like straight man, straight man, funny man. So there's like, I don't know. He has a lot to bounce off of. The, the best parts, I think, with him were like the really subtle ones where he's cooking the rabbit. And he's like, it's really good. And John Larry is like, this tastes like shit, man. And he's like, yeah, I know. He's like, it's really good. Isn't it? Uh, so it's 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 not like it's not the like the most well crafted joke in the world, but I thought it was funny, and I was like, yeah, that's nice. Uh, and then I think they paint Italians in such a way where it's like, you know what? They're okay with just living in this shack where you have no idea where their money comes from or where their food or resources come from. But they're happy, and that's the Italian way, right, Jared? Is, is that a way to describe the entire country? Are you uh, basing well, this I, on uh, your own understanding of uh, the geopolitical well, we, scene in Italy? We would have to add rape to that classification just because of all of the Criterion movies we've seen so far and how they paint the Italian there's people. A lot, there's a lot of grab ass. There's what a lot of grab ass. Lustful eyes. I just, what is that movie where they're following that woman around all trying to rape her? Uh, that is all of Italian cinema, I think. Just all of Italian cinema. Yeah, yeah exactly. So there's that. Um, yeah, I like Bob quite a bit. I think he's pretty funny. Uh, it does, it very quickly turns into an Abbott and Costello act with him, I think, where... Who's on first? Who's on first, exactly, where all of the comedy is basically like, hey, what's, that? what's up with that banana? And it's like, banana? Hardly knew her. And you're like, oh, you know about rectum? <laughs> you know what I mean, Jared? Yeah. Rectum. Hardly knew him. Right, Jared? Hey, there's no dead air on podcasts. <laughs> dead air is intentional. So uh, I like that. Um, my first line, uh, when Ellen Barkin has given Tom Waits a rough time, I wrote down woman, woman, women. Am I right? And I, I pointed out to Andrea. I was like, check this out, baby. And she was just like, <sighs> just like, you know, sheer disappointment. And like, yeah, she's sick of it. That's fine. We have other things. Um, I think Bob is the original Borat, which is nice. Whoa. What about, my, uh, what, my... what about cousin Valky? What is that? Oh, you, you are too young. You don't remember Perfect Strangers? I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, dude. Oh, it was a sitcom. Cousin Larry. I don't care. Cousin Valky. Well, well I mean, we could also talk about, like, uh, Andy Kaufman. Yeah, oh, yeah. And, and, then, and there's, like, the wild and crazy guys. Wild and crazy guys. Yeah. So, it's, I mean, there, so there's definitely other Borats, but yeah. Yeah, I was just saying that you reminded me of Borat. Come on. 
ba- Balki uh, Bartokolkomos. He's a the Greek Greek Mediterranean cousin, played by Bronson Bronson Pinchon. Look it up. I'll send you some links. I'll, I'll you'll know you'll know Bronson you. Pinchon. Yeah, is that like Thomas Pinchon, the uh, yeah, unphotographable yeah. author? Yeah, the recluse. Yeah, the, yeah, cousin Balki, author of uh, Gravity's Rainbow. Nice. In that hit movie uh, with Joaquin Phoenix. Oh, <laughs> yep. The undisputed worst of the entire pantheon. Of a, a PT. Of PTA movies. Anyways, um, I also kind of like how corruptive this movie paints New Orleans to be. In the sense where it's like in the opening, there's just no people around at all. And you're like, what is this place? But then it's like, oh, if you go outside, you're going to get framed for either being a child molester or being a murderer or you will actually murder someone. Yep. But it won't be your fault. Yep. Nolans. Come come and visit us. <laughs> Nolans. And, come and, and, visit. and when you escape from prison, they're all like not catch you. I just think it would be like. Their infomercial would be like, Nolans, come and visit. And then it'd be a guy breaking out of jail. But in the background, it would be like someone beating up like a woman or a kid. And it would just it would just like freeze frame and it'd be like Cajun style. I feel like you could pretty well uh, use that same ad for like any state, though, like New York. Come to New York. You could probably Cajun tell, style. You tell, the, you tell the same story. Just change the uh, the food flavoring. Come to Omaha. Cajun style. Yeah. Western style. What do you think about the Cajuns, Jarrett? Uh, I have no opinions one way or another. Yeah, but do you like Cajun seasoning on your fries? No. From time to time? Not really. Not even from time to time? Not even from time to time. James Carville would be very disappointed in you. Yeah. I like Cajun style once in a while. Like, <laughs> Faberger has those curly fries and you can get the Cajun style salt, uh, salt on them. I remember when I was... What's in... up with... <laughs> Wait, what's up with you? <laughs> You so, remember what when you uh, were eating Cajun uh, no, style fries? Uh, I remember when this podcast was about movies. Still, <laughs> when was that? When was that ever the thing? Um, fucking like, hey, RJ! The first episode ever. This is what? two two movies in a row that are both black and white in an era where uh, the budget constraints might have forced the hand to make a movie black and white. In an era though, when mainstream audiences wanted color. What was the other movie we watched? Man bites dog. Well, that was made in the 60s. <laughs> yeah, the 1992, the new 60s. Is next week's going to be black and white also? No. Oh, wait, I know what next week is. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah. So, Never mind. So in my mind, I was like, when I was watching this, it kind of reminded me of these, like, actually yesterday working at the comic store, I had two different conversations with people talking about how uh, they don't like reading old comics. They find them unreadable. And I'm like, what do you mean old comics? Mean? Yeah, just comics that don't look like modern comics now. Like an X-Men off the shelf, they find very readable. Very readable comic But, but if you try to hand them, say, Alan, Alan Moore's Watchmen, they go, I can't read this. Watchmen's book's great, though. I would It would make more sense if it was, like, from hell. Yeah. But even that is, like, pretty clear to read. Anyways. Well, well shut up, Jared. I know I like From Hell too. I'm just I meant like in terms of like art style mm. because it's like yeah, watch or er, From Hell is like a novel, yeah. pretty much because it's all text. So it's like I could see new age comic people complaining about that, but like Watchmen's pretty the art in that's pretty great. I don't know what the problem would be. It's, it's old. I've heard it described as dot comics, and I go, uh, I, I beg your pardon. You know that pop art? <laughs> yeah. That rasturbator. Yeah. Anyways, yeah, yeah. What? Hey, what is it? What are we talking about? Jim Jarmusch? Yeah, something like that. Man, look at his hair. Who hates Down by Law? Other than Andy? Uh, well, she didn't hate it. She just thought it was bad. <laughs> oh, I see. Uh, first yeah. up, Daniel S. Half a star. Is that a repeat offender? I, I feel like it is. You know, if all the scenes in this movie had the cool soundtrack the opening did, I uh, might have actually not minded this movie. I'm a sucker for a good soundtrack, but as it is, <laughs> it is unbearably, intolerably boring. Bob is not funny. Zach and Jack are barely different from each other and equally unlikable. I wanted to give it a full star for some of the conversations that border on charming, but there is nothing that can cure the dullness of this flick. I defy 
anyone to tell me that this has a deeper meaning. Also, <laughs> I saw another reviewer on here that they say on here that they recommended this especially to fans of Quentin Tarantino. What? When does this movie, with its slow action and uninspired dialogue, even come close to being being Tarantino esque? Mm, that's a that's a bad word to use, I think, for any person for any walk of life any walk of life i'm pretty sure this guy is a a repeat offender their um twitter handle is three-faced janus you know how every criterion movie starts with janus films or Giannis even no 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 janus okay is how it's pronounced uh favorite films are just criterion movies 12 angry men amadeus yo jimbo apparently Mm. Um, weird, like the half star movies are all like 50s, 60s sci-fi, which I feel like is a weird thing to go after, you know, because it's like, if you don't like those movies, don't watch those movies. Yeah. But (coughs) I don't know, dear. Too many smokes over there. Koyin Sakatsi was a half star, which I've never seen that, but I've heard it was a good show. Koyin is, Wow. Yeah, but they also just gave two and a half stars to The Patriot, which, no, 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 Jared. Okay. So, I don't know. I think this is a repeat offender. Okay. Uh, one star from Orcs. Ooh, that's a good name. Saruman's Men. <laughs> there he is. Uh, the great independent works of a certain period, period are of little oh. value to us today. I think they end up echoing the joke of Frost. Like Deacon Frost from Blade One, or yes, <clears throat> is that what they were talking about? I I, I assume that's what they're talking we about. We can mm-hmm. we can only assume. Or else uh, they're talking about Bob Frost. No one's talking about uh, you know Bob Frost. You know Walt Whitman. <laughs> Funny jokes if you've seen the movie. Uh, Orcs is from Beijing, and uh, one of their favorite movies is La Dolce Vita, oh, which is. Lord. A major bummer. Uh, they get five stars to everything. Okay, it but this, but uh, yeah, all the half star movies are. Um, I don't even rec- like. It's just all. It looks like all Chinese movies. I don't even know what most of these are. But Rambo half a star. Fuck off. Wait, the new Rambo. Two thousand eight's Rambo. Yeah, <laughs> that is not a half star movie. Not in the oh half star to Silence of the Lambs. What the <laughs> fuck. Get, I started the Matrix. Get get out of here. Get, get here. bent, brah. Finally, Terry Clegg. One star. Terry, Terry. Clegg. It's a weird name. All right. One for the film school, Boars. <laughs> as hard to give a shit as it was to reach the end without snoozing. Tom Waits looks good in it, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Terry Clegg has an eclectic sense of movies. Mm-hmm. Only four or five star movies, and it's like Rope, The Lost Weekend, The Apartment, and Animal Lisa, hmm. Lisa, which is weird. Uh, but there's also only three half star films, which are Blue Jasmine, Two <laughs> Guns. In 500 Days of Summer with my boy, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, which seems unfair. But one-star films are Down by Law, She's Gotta Have It, Man Bites Dog, and then your favorite movie, Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. Yep. It's a weird, not, not a super active account. Gotcha. I'll say. Well. If you, if you know what I mean, Jared. Ugh. There you have it. You know what I mean, Jared. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> RJ's hopefully done over there. Uh, Jim Jarmusch. Uh, I would say start with Stranger Than Paradise. So jump way ahead in that Criterion creep. And then uh, what? And then work your way forward. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're either going to like his stuff or not. Like it's pretty clear cut. You're either on board or not. Uh, Patterson's yep. a very different type of movie, though. I'd say that's probably his most um, audience-friendly. What, Patterson? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty accessible. Yeah, Broken Flowers is kind of like, if you're really into Bill Murray. 
Yeah, but I feel like people who are like nowadays really into Big Murray, mm-hmm. they they don't actually like Bill Murray. They're just into the Inter- chive. They're they're into internet Bill Murray in like Yeah. So when you watch stuff like Broken Flowers, they they're like, oh, "I like it. It's got Bill Murray in it." But in in their hearts, in their heart of hearts, mm-hmm. they're just like, "What? <laughs> what are we doing?" And you're yeah. It's like what this podcast is. Yeah. In our heart of hearts, we're bad. And with that said, mm-hmm. after the break, it's the end of the podcast. RJ's going to, out to the West Coast. I'm going to the East Coast. We're going to part ways. You said I was going to the East Coast? Well, which one would you prefer? <laughs> Whichever one you're not. Sounds like a plan. Leave me alone.